Take a breath, step outside. A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to Indigenous Ways Wisdom Circle. Uh, we like to start off our evening by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country throughout Turtle Island and pay respect to our elders, past and present. We want to take this time to acknowledge traditional owners and ancestors of these lands we reside on in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Pueblo people, and wherever you're beaming in from, acknowledge the traditional owners and ancestors of the lands you're at so we could all be here today. Indigenous Ways is dedicated to bridging cultural exchange with people globally. The goal is always and will continue to be dropping walls of separation. We are all one, nobody before, nobody behind, nobody below, nobody above. We are five-fingered ones, our blood flows red. We are all, all in this together. So with that, we have our beautiful, amazing Dr. Zalima Harris hailing in from the desert lands of Tucson, Arizona. Dr. Zalima Harris has so many accolades and awards and she's been presidents of colleges. She's been the NAACP president, uh, CEO. She's, uh, I know Zalima's story and uh, a little tiny slice of it I know through her daughter who's a very good friend of mine. And uh, hello, Narissa, if you're here and all of Zalima's family, thank you for joining us this evening. So let's go ahead and get started this evening with our beautiful Dr. Z, as Gwen Frederick says. Uh, let's get started. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, Black History Month? Oh, sure. Um, I'm really happy to do so because um, in my career, every February, somebody asked me to talk about Black history. And after a few years, I stopped. It was too stressful. There were too many reminders of my life here under Jim Crow laws. And, but I, years later, I began to reflect and I thought any opportunity somebody gives me to talk about my history in this country, I'm gonna take it. I've mellowed um, with old age. So um, let me say uh, the idea of black history came from an educator journalist, gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Uh, Carter and he founded Black History Week. We had one week in 1926, and it was not until 1976 when a month was given to celebrate our achievements, but also to um, recognize the role we played in the economic development of this country. Now, I support Black History Month. It should be the entire year. And one of the areas we normally spend time on is the achievement of Blacks in this country. We seldom talk about the role we played in the economic development of the, these United States. So for me, it is delving into slavery. You can't talk about black history unless you talk about slavery. There is a project called uh, the New York Times uh, sponsored it. It's called um, uh, Project 1619 because 
that's the year when the first slaves entered the shores of Virginia. And that particular project is something, especially the curriculum, it should be infused in every classroom throughout the country because what it does, it reframes slavery in a way that's authentic. And it also encourages teachers to learn more about that period in our history. And to tell you how strong the opposition to the teaching of slavery is, there are three states that have introduced laws in the state legislature to deny the teaching of Project 1619. They don't want the truth told. They think it's divisive. So as a country, we have denied that stain on our history since slavery existed. Nobody wants to talk about it and the vestiges of slavery that are still with us. So unless we understand what happened during those years and afterwards, especially during Reconstruction, 1865 to around 1877, we will never really appreciate Black folk as humans and the role we have played in creating wealth for so many people. Because when you look at the South, cotton was major, it was king. 60% of the cotton in this world was grown in the South, black folk picking cotton. It created tremendous wealth, especially in Mississippi. There were many, many millionaires created by hard labor. So when you talk about reparations, I support it. I don't wanna get a check, but I do want this government to invest in our communities because what we see are laws, rules, regulations that have kept black people, many of whom in the conditions they're in now. So I support it. Um, and so thank you for asking me about black history because it gives me a chance to say why I support it and also why I didn't ever want to talk about it because nobody wants to hear the truth. They want you to put a poster up and say, this one did this, um, but never, um, and that's important, but never the institution of slavery that's still with us today. Thank you. May have been too long. <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your perspective with us. Much respect to you. I didn't add this in the chat question, but I'm going to throw this in because it seems appropriate. You were the president for the NAACP chapters. Can you share your experience with that? And what were the effects from the wider community? Well, I think I got involved in NAACP when I moved to Kansas City and there was a lawsuit uh, by the Kansas City uh, residents to desegregate the schools. Now, mind you, Supreme Court decision occurred 1954 when um, separate but equal was abolished, but we still had all black and all white schools. And 
I became involved uh, because I wanted to learn more. I didn't grow up in an urban area. I spent a little time in a city or a town of 60,000 for three and a half years in high school. But I was unfamiliar and I was in grad school uh, working on my doctorate at the University of Kansas. And what I was assigned to do by the NAACP president, Julia Hill, was to uncover the amount of money the district was spending on lawyers to avoid desegregating. And I might add at that time, the Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas was head of EEOC. And he held many workshops for people across the country, uh, mostly K through 12 personnel uh, to provide guidance on how they could avoid complying with the law. And that was my interpretation. So I went to the school district and spent hours plowing through minutes to determine the waste of money on lawyers to keep the schools separate and unequal. I think if I recall correctly, the first presentation I made to the board of the Kansas City branch of the NAACP is that we had spent over a quarter of a million dollars paying lawyers to keep the schools separate. And I think that report shed a lot of light. It was publicized. And at that point, I was asked to serve as chair of education. Um, you know, Elena, Tosh, I could go on for the rest of my time talking about the complaint I brought along with two other parents to the uh, Civil Rights Division of the Department of Education. Um, but it was grueling. It took a lot of work. Uh, but eventually, the school district did desegregate. They abolished the tracking system where they had A, B, and C groups, four groups, advanced placement A, B, and C. And most of the C group of students in the high school were those well, they were black kids. And um, that was a major effort of mine was to eliminate the reduction in the quality of education. And it was brought to my attention, my kids have always played a central role in my activism. And it was Narissa who came home, she was in high school and she said, um, mom, I'm in a class and we're not gonna learn Shakespeare. And of course her name is Shakespearean. Nerissa was the lady in waiting to Portia in The Merchant of Venice. And she had talked to one of her white friends and they were comparing notes and the young lady said, oh, we're studying Shakespeare. So Narissa goes, well, we're not. So she went into the classroom and asked her teacher, probably not as um, carefully as she probably could have, when are we gonna study Shakespeare? And the teacher responded, well, you're not. You're in a B group 
and we don't study Shakespeare. Oh, wow. So Narissa rushed home and told me about it. I then, first I wanted to gather my facts. So I went to the school, talked to them. The school at the time had very few Blacks enrolled. And the principal surprisingly said to me, oh, I don't like that stratified grouping either because they cause trouble for me. All the ones in C, they just raise heck all day. So he said, I support it. I support it. I was shocked. Wow. And so I then, we did a blitz at the school board. I would take a different student every school board meeting, and we would talk about the reduction in the quality of education. I coined that term for Black students and other students. And finally, there was no action. So I filed the complaint with the Office of Civil Rights, and we were successful. So that was all through the NAACP, and I could not have done that as an individual, nor as, you know, with just friends, but the NAACP supported my efforts. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, and, uh, but I was very active um, for many years until I moved to a location where there was no viable NAACP at the local level. And so I became involved, more involved in the Urban League. Um, those were my two major organizations. And any march, tell me about any march that um, disenfranchised groups where they needed support and I was always there. So I listed those um, uh, unions. Um, I was a strong supporter of unions, um, uh, women's rights, later LGBTQ. Um, and there might be some others, but any disenfranchised group, I was there to support them. Yes, very good. Well, I have so much I want to ask you, but I think this leads to the question that skips down a few that says, uh, what is an ally to you and how do you teach them how to be respectful and not step over the line and feel the need to take over? I think you have to be clear about your objectives and um, what criteria you will use to select membership in whatever group it is. And I think your clarity and having an understanding of the folk you're trying to bring in or who want to be a part, not everybody can be an ally. They have to buy into your vision, your goals, your objectives. And I think that cuts down on, I'm taking over. If you're organized, you know where you're going, I think you're gonna attract the right kind of people. And if, anybody gets out of line, you might call them to the side and say, hey, that's not the direction we're going. Right. You're our ally, you're not in charge of this and be very frank. Yeah. And I think we, t and women especially, we're so afraid of hurting people's feelings. That's right. Um, you know, it's like, oh no, I can't say that to her she'll get upset or she knows somebody more powerful and they will, and that will affect what we're doing. And I can tell you, courage conquers a lot. If you're courageous, if you have clarity, you know where you're headed, you have a vision, 
And um, I think you can avoid it. I have not been in very many situations where I have seen that occur in my own groups. Right. Uh, I recall once I was at a meeting and it was um, at the University of Kansas and there were, it was a diverse group and I was leading an effort and um, to bring more faculty, black faculty and staff to the university. And one of our allies, a white woman walked up to me afterwards and she told me where I could be more useful in the civil rights movement. Oh, wow. And I said, um, thank you, but I decide where my skills are and where I can be more effective. So please never do that again. And she looked at me and never worked with the group again. Oh. And I think she saw an emerging leadership role for herself. And she saw a future where she could say, this is what I did to help to bring about change at the University of Kansas. Right. So I'm very clear. And I think as women, we really need to be clear. And I still talk to my daughters today about toughening up. And I think with women, when people offend us, our first reaction is pain. It's, yeah, but rather, I think the first reaction should be anger. Um, and then you can mellow into the other stages of dealing with racism. But how you direct that anger is different. And I have always walked around with just a little bit of anxiety and anger, which those have propelled me to do the work that needs to be done. Beautiful. Sure, I love, I'm, you know, I like Bell Hooks and I love her work on love as an action verb as opposed to a noun. I know that, but even my anger is in love. And I believe she also speaks to that. So I may not be representing her properly. It, you have to remember it's been about 20 years, more than 20 years since I've read her. But um, yeah, we, we as women have to toughen up, not be cruel, but we can't go there and start feeling pain and hurt, but we have to do something with what people are throwing out. Right. And I had a conversation recently with my daughter and I was saying, you know, if I've responded to every um, attack against me by resorting to, well, I cried many times, so I can't say tears, but uh, going to a place that doesn't allow you to act because it's very easy when you are mistreated by someone for no other reason other than your gender, your sexual orientation, or your race. It is painful. It hurts. But I... I bypass that immediately and try to figure out what am I going to do with this? And I was telling Narissa recently uh, what I did at the college where I was CEO uh, in a rural area, uh, less than 5% of the people were people of color. 
Uh, there were many things said that I got and I built case studies around those and used that knowledge to teach leadership training to predominantly white women leaders. So every, I didn't absorb it. I deflected and used it to teach. And sure, there were times when I was distraught. So I want to um, commend Arissa because she recently had a really bad situation by a racist man who's been on her back for a very long time. And she took that um, hurt and pain and she protected herself. Yes. And so I'm very pleased with that. I applaud women who are able to do that and I encourage them to do it. Beautiful, thank you so much. Well, we have some really beautiful questions coming in from the audience and I have a whole bunch of other questions. I just wanna, this sounds like a perfect segue into the next question. Uh, well, it's not the next question, it's a couple of down, but can you talk about ego and does it have a place in educational leadership? You know, I have mixed emotions. I think you've got to have some level of self-confidence, which is not ego to me. Ego, as I see it, is self-aggrandizement. It's doing things for your own um, selfish purposes. Okay. And I guess I would have to say, no, there is no place. But confidence, yes, which is distinctly different. I'm just making this up, That's thinking true. of this as you ask the question. But I, I do talk about servant leadership when I was doing a lot of workshops, three and four a year for women across the country. And um, you're a servant of the people and there is no place for anyone, as my mom would say, riding on their high horse and trying to lead. If you get too far away from those who are following, you're not leading. And so, there are too many people in leadership positions and it's all about them and not about the people. Thank I always you. saw my role as, as one of service to help people to become um, and do everything I can in providing resources, mentoring to help people to get to that next place where they want to be, they define what they want to become, what they want to do. And my role is to help them to get there. Beautiful, thank you. And so what is authentic to you and what are the layers one must go through to get there? Well, Tash, I'm still working on that. When you've been brought up, to avoid um, um, letting people know exactly what you think and how you feel for fear of retribution. And it had more to do about race. I barely took that advice, but there were many times that I did and I think that's why um, I'm writing. Um, it's, it's hard to peel those layers back because for black folk in particular, and that's all I know, um, it is, about trying to get to that core of what do I really believe? And I remember at a workshop, someone asked me a similar question. 
And I said, you have to know what you are willing to be fired for because during the civil rights movement, we were told you have to know what you're willing to die for. Wow. So in a place of work, you have to know that. And there are few absolutes in life. And you have to have clarity on what you believe. And I'll give you one example. Um, I've never talked about my political affiliation. I was always an independent because I served institutions uh, where there was a diversity of opinion and political party affiliation, Green Party, uh, it fizzled, um, independent, Republican, Democrats. So I never articulated to anyone. Um, and I was asked by the governor of a state, I received a call asking, would I uh, be a delegate uh, for the Republican Party um, convention? And I just said, oh, he didn't ask for an answer. He said the senator would call me from that state and talk to me about it. I thanked him. And about a week later, the senator called and he was all excited about me representing the state. And I told him I'd get back with him and I talked to my board chair about it. And all my board members were Republicans with exception of one out of seven. And he said, oh, we love it, we love it. Just think about what can happen when you retire. You're gonna be on all these paying boards, not the United Way that doesn't pay you, but you'll be on the, all those boards, uh, corporate boards where you will make a lot of money and you never have to worry. So I said to him, I represent every person at this institution so I thank you, but I'm gonna decline. So I did call the Senator and I told him, I didn't talk about the values of the party, uh, but I talked about something that was safe yet true. Um, so I knew that their values did not represent my values. So that's the kind of thing. And what I see now People have no idea what they believe. The first strong wind, they will move in that direction rather than being true to yourself. And it's not always easy, but I feel comfortable in knowing that I have been true to my core beliefs throughout my adult life. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to just end my questions with one last question, which is our theme for this year since we made it through rising resilience last year through the COVID virus and the isolation and all of that that just shook our lives uh, like an overnight storm. So this year our theme is what is thriving and purpose? for not just you now, Dr. Zalima Harris, but for everybody out there that's listening that wants to hear some really good words of wisdom. Yeah, I was in a period after retirement where I devoted all of my time to my children, granddaughter. I did volunteer work, I've always volunteered. Um, so it took me a little while to figure it out. And I've always wanted to do a blog. I used to write for a local newspaper in Kansas City. It was a weekly, an African-American newspaper. And I was going to get syndicated, <coughs> but 
um, I was offered another job, another presidency at a larger institution. And so I chose to do that. And I knew that my writing would impede my goals at that college because words matter. And I'm not <clears throat> too shy about speaking out. So I chose not to. So blog has been on my mind since 2011. And my children heard me. So my daughter, Cynthia, just set up the site recently. And so my first blog will go live tonight after this show. But that's what's pulling me now. It's giving me purpose. But it has to be something that wakes you up in the morning and you're excited about doing it. Purpose, um, you can't define it for anyone. They have to define what matters to them. And I think it gives you joy. Frustrating, yes, the technology for me, but it brings such tremendous joy to bring to print what you believe that might be helpful to those who read it. Um, and also it's a process of of peeling the layers back. <laughs> so I think that's why I said it was process because some things in my first blog, I didn't want to mention. And then there are some that are even deeper. I would have pulled back more layers, but I was comfortable in the first blog peeling back just a few layers. So I think really tapping into what you enjoy doing what would wake you up in the morning and bring you a little bit of joy each day? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Sounds like your message is be true to yourself first and foremost, and then you can truly be of service and true to others. But we can't do that by being too codependent. So thank you very <laughs> much, Dr. Z. I'm gonna do a quick commercial break and there's a lot of questions, a lot of people. And I'm just gonna mention really quickly, Kate Groves, March 10th. She is a beautiful sister that lives in Holland. She's uh, deaf. She's in a PhD program out of Rome and she just had a baby. So she's uh, taking her PhD program out of sabbatical. She's back into it. She's going to talk about all kinds of stuff, uh, her schooling, her childhood, and how she ended up in Europe in a PhD program, that the sky is the limit when you've got uh, education and, and uh, a goal and clarity of what you want to do with your life. And following that, we have our beautiful Navajo role model, Marley Shabala. She is a journalist. She's been a journalist on the Navajo Nation for, I'd say, over 30 years. I'd have to read up on her history, but she is a real mover and shaker with the truth. She shows up at the uh, places that people don't want to go and she tells the truth to the people and that's what she does. She lives traditionally on the reservation in Navajo lands. And right after that, we have our third Saturday performance of the month, Tori. Tori Trujillo is a beautiful healer. She's a singer songwriter, uh, one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard. So she's gonna be one of our presenters. And then after that, we're gonna have Mimi Gonzalez back and she's another one that's in by demand. Uh, people want um, Mimi Gonzalez back. She's uh, very educated, but she's also very funny. So uh, she doesn't only have a professional life in a university, but she also has a, a life as a comedian. So imagine that, that's gotta be hard. And our last presenter for next month is our traditional Navajo elder, Jane Ballou from Black Mountain. She will be with uh, her daughter, Lynn Dean, who is the community 
uh, worker on Black Mountain to bring goods to the people where we take this, the goods. And uh, most of all, I wanted to mention that next week for the Wisdom Circle, we do have Tommy Orange. And Tommy Orange uh, is one of those overnight successes. He uh, went to the Institute of American Indian Arts and got his master's degree, worked with some of the likes of Pam Houston and some others. And before he even graduated, he was signed by a very significant publishing company and his book, There There, went best-selling. And uh, there's a lot to say about Tommy Orange, but I won't take up too much time just to let you all know that Tommy Orange will be with us next Wednesday. Thank you, Tommy, for being with us this evening. And uh, if you want to check us out, uh, there's more information at indigenousways.org, very user-friendly website. Uh, thank you all for being with us this evening and our concert series, our presenters, and you'll also find a video library with over 80 presenters we've hosted through this platform. We'd love for you to share this recorded video with everyone, which will be available in the next 48 hours on our website. And uh, this virtual event series started, uh, kicked off last April, and since then, we uh, have been able to stay connected on a world stage here. Uh, people come, it's a very intimate stage, but through our social media platforms, people have been able to zoom in from New Zealand and Australia and all over the show. elena has got a lot of peeps back home that love this as well. And share this, share this space, please do. While you're at our website, indigenousways.org, uh, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter. And below me is all our social media pages. Please like, and uh, if you're in, uh, do it right now. You can subscribe. And uh, we're really grateful. This really helps us to keep going. All our virtual events have ASL interpreters and are free. Uh, we think this is a beautiful, um, uh, we love our ASL interpreters. So thank you, Chris and Chandra. And we have to thank our sponsors. Uh, the Native American Advised Fund, Santa Fe Community Foundation, West Staff, and New Mexico Arts. And we also would not be doing this without our board members. We have an amazing group of board members with us here this evening. Thank you all for believing in us and supporting us with your sacred wisdom. We are going to do our Navajo Nation Deaf and Hard of Hearing Relief Run next uh, on March 18th. And we actually have some liaisons on the New Mexico and Arizona side, Navajo and Deaf, Arletta and Dennis. Arletta is with us here tonight. Hi, Arletta. Thank you for joining us. So we have people on the reservation that are able to take us to where the need is to do these drops for the PPE uh, food and supplies. So we're getting ready for that. So everybody that wants to get involved, please join us and uh, donate if you'd like. If you can donate some uh, muscle power, we could sure use your help loading these boxes, loading them into the U-Hauls the day before Wednesday, Wednesday, March 17th. Get in touch with Elena. She'll be organizing and facilitating all these trucks going up. And uh, please be involved. We love you, thank you. And now is the time to go ahead and open it up to the rest of the audience. Those of you that wanna come in, Elena has opened the gates. So you're welcome to join us on video and Elena's welcome to join us too. Uh, Elena, come on in. And let's, uh, hey, Narissa, sister, how you doing? Thank you for being with us. So if you're in our Zoom, uh, please feel free to turn on your cameras uh, for questions or comments you might have for the beautiful Zalima Harris. Just remember we are being recorded. And if so, if you are in our social media or any of those, you'd like some questions, uh, please chat those in so we can ask. Uh, as people are joining us, Narissa, your microphone off uh, but is there anyone who would like to ask oh no you can keep it off if there's any questions we've got just make sure you're unmuted um, just to fire away who who would like to ask Zalima or say anything to Zalima I just wanted to say that was a great presentation and I always learned something that I didn't know <laughs> Oh, it was really good. 
It's good to see everybody. It's so great. It's really great. You guys have to check out the blog. It's really fantastic. Really fantastic. So, And uh, thank you, Tosh and Elena, for hosting uh, this tonight. We've got to have you back, too, Narissa. That would be great. great. Thank you, Narissa, for that. Uh, any other questions on the floor? Uh, just make sure you unmute. I have a question, Z. Hi. It's Hetty. I just want to know, how long did it take you to really get your, your grip on the fact that you had to do this for yourself? How long did it take you to decide that, you know, it was self that you had to deal with and not buying into others' issues during uh, your retirement? Because being such an extremely busy person, I would have thought it would have been really difficult to slow down. And just latching on to some of the other problems was probably easier than dealing with yourself. So when did you decide that that's what you needed to do to be true to yourself? You're, uh, you're muted, mom. Um, Hetty, it took a couple of years, I think. And, you know, I retired in 2006. So I had a year when I was in retirement <laughs> And I guess I wasn't ready. So then I left and assumed another position. Um, it, I would say it took about a year to a year and a half uh, because I found myself more involved. I think I wrote you and said, I find myself more involved in my children's lives than I want to be, and um, <laughs> but I but I enjoyed um, babysitting my only granddaughter, so that was fun. Uh, watching TV for the first time, uh, really watching movies and um, Housewives, and yeah, um, I enjoyed that, but. It, it does take a little while, I would say a year to two years, really, before I really decided what I needed to do. I was very active in an organization here where I was chair of all of the programs. And I wrote the annual report uh, each year to the nationals. So that was like a job. And now I'm just working, um, chairing a scholarship committee, which doesn't involve a lot of work with the group. It's more with students, which I enjoy reading applications, interviewing them. So I'm still going to do some of that but it takes a while. Um, and I can say my son helped me a lot. He was taking a psychogeriatrics, psychogerontology course in grad school. And he called one day and he wanted me to transfer my membership of this civic organization. And I said, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do that. And he, I guess, had learned something in class. <laughs> and he said, Mom, you've got to be involved in something. You're going to be a recluse. You're going to not have anything to do. What are you going to do? So at the last minute, I transferred my membership from Illinois to Arizona. I missed it. I, I wouldn't have been able to do it if I'd waited a couple of days. So I, the kids, um, I think Jay uh, is more uh, influential in, 
talking to me about doing something, the girls are very supportive because Cynthia set up the blog site. And of course, Narissa uses her poetic skills to uh, help frame titles and that sort of thing. But ultimately, but I think it's okay not to do anything for a while. I think it takes time. Um, yeah, it takes time and don't be hard on yourself if you're not being productive. I mean, being productive is doing stuff you love, having fun, waking up late. I mean, we all deserve that after a period of time. I see a, a question that from Wanda Bell that says, can you post link for blog? And I actually signed up for Z Zalima's blog and it's ZalimaHarris.com. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I'm really excited to be involved in the blog and I've already had some other people I sent it out to in my contacts that have joined your blog also. So we will definitely be involved on some level. And uh, Diane Forsey, thank you for being here this evening. Do you wanna ask your own question or do you want me to read it? Okay, I'll read it. I, uh, Diane's asking you, you said you would support reparations that involve government investment in communities. Is there any other way that you would like to see reparations made? And what is disenfranchisement specifically? What factors contribute to it? That's kind of several loaded things. Yeah, I haven't taken a position on the various ways reparations can occur, but I'm opposed to personal checks being handed out. We have, um, yeah, and, and for me, it's recognizing that the economic disparities that exist, many are caused, call, caused by the institution of slavery and the aftermath. And if you think about it, you think in terms of every time, and my blog talks about this, we gain visible recognition and power. Uh, whites in this country and those with power often use the supporters of the past president who stormed the Capitol, uh, white terrorists. They allow them to do their work to keep us black people in our place. So reparations should be discussed, researched, I would say a national panel and come up with some credible solutions, but I don't have them. I just know something needs to be done to correct the inequities. We never got the 40 acres and a mule um, that was promised as so many other treaties that the government has violated with indigenous people. Um, so yeah, I'm, I think I've answered the question in my own way. I don't have the answer but I think there are people far more knowledgeable who can uh, work on this. Thank um, you for that, Delta. And disenfranchisement, anyone who's not a member of the majority and who suffers discrimination, whether it's due to your sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, gender, um, and to me, you're not a part of mainstream. Thank you very much for that. And 
Your uh, daughter, Cynthia, would like to say some words. Thank you for being with us, Cynthia. Oh, sure. Thank you but so much. This is so amazing. First of all, I just want to say that as a, I'm a writer and mom is the reason that I'm a writer. Her stories, the stories that she tells are the reason, they are the firewood for everything I've ever written and everything I will write. And so what's so amazing is seeing her tell the story of her sister who was murdered by uh, the sheriff and his deputies in this first blog that she's written about and the way in which she's connected that white terrorism that she experienced as a young girl to the white terrorism that exists today. And I just was wondering if you might want to mention or say anything. I just wanted to say that. I know it's almost time to go, but if you wanted to talk about how your stories, um, just what those are to you and what what those stories that you've told us, what those mean. Well, you know, I think I'm a better writer than speaker. And even when I was rearing you all, I would write you. I use letters to discuss issues and especially with my son, um, I feel more comfortable in that world. And I think I owed it to my father to get that out in public, in print before I die. Um, I think I, I owed it to him. Um, and I think he's happy tonight that when he couldn't speak about it, um, I can. And Cynthia, you've done all the research, so you know more about it than I do. But since I'm unmuted, if you look at my screen, you will see that uh, your website, Elena and uh, Tosh, is on my television. Yes. That's what my son did uh, today. So everything I do, it becomes a family deal. I love my children. Uh, sometimes I'm a little hard on them, but I I live for them and I always have. Thank you. Zalima, we are out of time, everyone. We are out of time. Just in keeping with honoring everybody's time, let's go ahead and call it a night. But before we say good night, I want to thank our beautiful participants that have joined us this evening, your beautiful three children, Gwen, Frederick, and so many of you, Sarah, your congratulations on your retirement, Christine McDewitt from Ohio, Dawn, all of you, Mom, Harry from the Res, Amber, Missy, our beautiful sister, Gwen, we love you, we miss you, everybody, everybody, James Harris, oh, what a beautiful man you are. Uh, we are so blessed and delighted to have you all with us tonight. And we also wanna thank our beautiful ASL interpreters. And we want to also honor our Zoom social media live and those that are gonna be watching the recording on our website in the future. We thank you in advance. And we are so grateful for your time tonight, all of you especially Dr. Zalima Harris. Yes! 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 Thank you. Thanks so much, Tosh, Chris, Tosh, and Tosh. So, you know, what you can do, everyone, in the chat boxes throughout uh, our social media, please support Dr. Zalima at her beautiful blog, which is zalimaharris.com. That's Z, is that how you say it? Or do you do We Z? say Z. Oh, sorry. Z-E-L-E-M-A-H-A-R-R-I-S.com. So go to Zalima. Dot com. Please subscribe for that wonderful wisdom. You just had a little slither of it tonight. Thank you all those that got to ask questions. We'll look forward to seeing you here next Wednesday with the beautiful Tommy Orange as we kick off uh, History Month for Women, Women's History Month. And in saying that, let's give it one, one more time for the amazing 
Touch the earth, touch the earth, touch the earth.